While wars and other man-inflicted sufferings greatly affect populations, they can often be avoided through diplomacy. Such cannot be said for the whims of nature that, when they strike, have disastrous consequences for the locals. The deadliest natural disaster in world history happened in the north of China at the end of the 19th century. It would see the death of over 10 million people. The 19th century, nicknamed Century of Humiliation by the Chinese, saw the great Qing Empire lose wars, influence and resources to foreign powers. During the second half of the century, Japan notably seized Taiwan in 1874, only agreeing to withdraw after a heavy compensation by China. Due to these events, the empire's coffers were vastly depleted. Internal conflicts such as the Taiping, Nian and Muslim rebellions also led to a great reduction in regional grain reserves that were kept for emergencies. Furthermore, in 1875, after the death of the Tongzhi Emperor, the four-year-old Guangxu ascended to the throne, strategically placed by his aunt, the cunning Empress Dowager Cixi. As his coronation was disputed, this unity in the government prevented coordination in directives given to run the nation. Conditions were the worst possible to deal with a natural disaster. And that is precisely when one broke out. In the northern part of the country, in early 1876, an immense drought occurred, hitting the agriculture and causing crops to die out. Subsequent harvests were extremely bad. Throughout history, as the nation had endured many other famines, leaders and local authorities usually kept reserves in granaries, following a policy known as Gung San Yu Yi, with the saying, San Yan Gung Bi, Yo Yi Nian Zhe Shi, Jiu Nian Gung Bi, Yo San Yan Zhe Shi, meaning a three years of farming, keep one year as reserves, and of nine, three. The reserves had, however, been mostly depleted due to the conflicts in the area, and soon ran dry as well. Due to these shortages, the value of food increased to up to 10 times its normal price. Five provinces were especially affected Shanxi, Henan, Shandong, Zhili, and Shanxi. The first four had been strongly impoverished due to rebellions, as active warfare in these areas had been very costly. But the resources of Shanxi had also been sapped by taxes to support the war effort. A famine started to develop in the north of China as the vast majority of households were unable to afford the food. As no rain clouds were to be seen in the skies, it soon became apparent that the situation was far from resolved. Many would die, and families were put through the excruciating choice of choosing which family members to feed and which to abandon. Due to the social organization of China at the time, young girls were the first to suffer. But as the drought went on and food became even more scarce, everyone gradually fell under the effect of the famine. It was urgent for a state intervention to prevent the disaster from worsening and to relieve the victims. In normal times, food could have been imported from the south, Manchuria or Mongolia, but in the late 19th century, the Qing authorities were too impoverished and focused on the south and coastlines to deal effectively with the problems and to take adequate actions. By June 1876, the first state measures of relief were launched, and tales of silver were sent to the provinces. Cash was however of little utility compared to actual food, and these efforts only offered minor relief. In parallel, Christian missionaries who had gained a lot of influence after the Opium Wars started to provide help to the locals. British missionary Timothy Richards tried to bring international attention to the famine. Practically no rain or snow fell during autumn and winter, and rivers ran dry. By spring 1877, the prices of food had reached astronomical amounts. The poorest locals, who were not yet dead, desperately tried to survive on roots and tree bark. Those who had animals or pets ate them. As the rain failed again that year, the famine greatly worsened and masses starved to death. It is also reported that bandit groups formed and occasionally raided villages to survive. Travelers were stopped and robbed or killed. In March 1877, groups of Western businessmen, diplomats and Protestants and Catholic missionaries organized themselves at a famine relief committee and traveled to the province of Shandong, which greatly helped the locals. This was one of the first acts of humanitarian aid in history. The other provinces were however still in dire straits. The starving fell to the grounds in the streets, 
Bodies started to pile up on the sides of the roads, and as if the locals were not troubled enough, a pestilence broke out as a result of this. It was not identified by the Chinese, but Westerners believed it to have been typhus. After all the vegetation had been eaten, some of the starving locals resorted to eat mud, clay, and weathered rocks. Such a diet killed most of those who tried it by blocking or rupturing their digestive system. By then, cannibalism had become a common practice. Although it was illegal under penalty of death, in such times, very few magistrates bothered with prosecuting the practitioners. Luis Monagata, the Roman Catholic bishop of Shanxi, reported, Previously, people had restricted themselves to cannibalizing the dead. Now they kill the living to have them for food. Husbands eat their wives, parents eat their sons, and daughters and children eat their parents. A Chinese district magistrate confirmed these claims, having made his own observations. A grandson chopped his grandmother to pieces, a niece boiled and ate her aunt. The authorities were torn between one faction trying to spend resources on reinforcing the coastlines to defend against foreign aggression, and another urging to help the victims. An official state relief program was finally launched in November 1877, but by then the situation had worsened even more. Grain was transported from Manchuria and sold at reduced prices, a practice used many times in China's past, known as Ping Tiao. The mountainous regions like Shanxi and Shandong, however, made the relief expeditions very challenging and slowed them down to great extents. Soup kitchens were also opened, a practice invented back in the Ming Dynasty. The Qing authorities had two objectives with these. Zhou Si, Fang Liao, relieve the starving, prevent people flow. Preventing mass migration was considered the most important issue, as the Qing could not afford the risk of pillaging or the rise of another rebellion. The measures were still not enough. Pushed to extremes, parents resorted to sell their children, especially daughters. Some husbands also sold or abandoned their wives. Out of these unfortunate young girls and women, most were bought by merchants who transported them to the south and sold them there as concubines and prostitutes. They were often beaten and abused along the way. Foreign attention to the famine was reinforced by this, as the English newspapers of Shanghai denounced the human trafficking and its perpetrators who cynically profited from the disaster. Still, the drought went on, and cannibalism continued to spread. More and more people also fled towards the south. The northern regions were depopulating fast. In early 1878, the drought was still going on. The British missionary Timothy Richard and his wife travelled to Shanxi, where the famine was most severe. He recalled what he saw in his famine diary. People pull down their houses, sell their wives and daughters, eat fruit and carrion, clay and leaves. News which nobody wonders at. The sight of men and women lying helpless on the side of the road, or if dead, torn by hungry dogs and magpies, and of children boiled and eaten up, is so fearful as to make one shudder. In spite of heavy efforts from foreign humanitarian aid and by the Qing authorities, the famine persisted. As the death toll increased, people were starting to lose hope. Many more migrated south. In early 1879, on another scorching day in the eastern regions of the drought, surviving locals were going on with their tasks. Suddenly, Dark clouds started to form in the sky, drops began to fall, and as the rain turned to a downpour, the locals realised their struggle was ending. Subsequent harvests on rehydrated soil were rich, and the famine was getting quenched. Disease was however still not yet over, and pestilence persisted for several months. The long nightmare for the locals was however coming to an end, but the stricken regions, especially Shanxi, had been strongly depopulated by either death or migration. The population had decreased by over 8 million, about half of the entire population in that region. For the other regions, more than 7 million, a fifth had died in Henan, over 3 million, a tenth in Zhili, and about 2 million, 5%, in Shandong. Shanxi counted about 2.4 million dead. Although the Great Drought had been extremely severe, the strongest since centuries if not millennia, its consequences could have been largely prevented with a better organization from the Qing authorities. 
The combination of low reserves of grain and money, national focus on other regions, and disunity within the government, however, led to the worst outcome for the population. In total, between 100 and 200 million people suffered from these events. Officials and scholars of the time tried to minimize the events, bringing focus instead on the foreign colonization by Western powers. The West saw this bad handling of the situation as a proof of China's backwardness. Between the two, most of the Chinese people grew angry at both the Manchu-led Qing dynasty's inefficiency and the imperialist foreign influence. The deadliest natural disaster in history had passed, but contempt within the population had yet again grown stronger. Thank you for watching my video, I hope you enjoyed it, if so please like and subscribe, and if you have any questions don't hesitate to leave them in the comments below.